I'm here today to talk about uh, tall buildings and energy efficient production and uh, what it might take to be ahead of the energy curve. And the energy curve being an ever increasing one with tenants demanding more and more energy uh, for their space and their use and tighter and tighter regulations promulgated by uh, various municipalities and a moral and ethical obligation to try to reduce energy consumption and the resultant uh, greenhouse gases um, from tall buildings. So, uh, uh, to mention, my name is Alexander Durst. I work for the Durst organization. We are a family uh, real estate business. I'm a member of the fourth generation. It's founded by my uh, great grandfather uh, exactly 100 years ago. And uh, he immigrated with many other Eastern Europeans uh, at the turn of the 20th century and um, learned that he had a knack for buying and selling real estate. With his uh, sons, they built uh, a real estate portfolio, first starting out here on Third Avenue, not too distant from where we are now, uh, building several buildings between 1958 and 1969. Um, my grandfather's generation continued uh, making the big leap out to Sixth Avenue, building uh, these three buildings here on 6th Avenue and then my father's generation uh, with his cousin Jody built uh, four times square and uh, one Bryant Park all towed about 10 million square feet in Midtown Manhattan. We are also uh, very fortunate and proud to be the uh, construction consultant, co-owner, leasing manager and manager of uh, One World Trade Center which comprises approximately 3 million square feet in downtown. So uh, we also have a growing residential portfolio. This is uh, the Helena, which comprises approximately 600 of the 700 residential units that we now own and manage. We are currently building a, uh, more residential units. By the end of this year, we'll have approximately 2,000 residential units under our ownership and management. Uh, being built as we speak are 710 residential units at 57th Street and the West Side Highway in this building designed by Bjark Ingels uh, via 57 West. Right next to that, a smaller building, 10 stories, Frank 57 West, where there are about 65 residential units, and another building on 6th Avenue and 31st Street, uh, where we have approximately 375 residential units on top of a commercial and retail base. Uh, we also have in design right now approximately 2,000 residential units um, in seven different buildings in Queens, New York City, and uh, have just started construction on the first building. So uh, the concentration, the majority of our buildings are here in Midtown Manhattan. And of course, we have one World Trade Center downtown where we have three million square feet. So getting back to the topic at hand, energy, if you look at this map distributed by the mayor's office of the city of New York, red areas, dark red areas are those areas where uh, the greatest energy demands are on a per square meter basis. So our buildings are in the areas where the greatest demand exists for energy uh, today. So um, with my, my father's generation, I should really say, we've always been building uh, buildings for long-term ownership, starting back in the 1950s with my grandfather's generation. My father's generation, they took uh, sustainability very seriously, and when they built four times square, it was the first building of its size to incorporate as many environmentally responsible features uh, as it did and helped to set uh, the precedents and the parameters for LEED certification. A portion of that is energy conservation and on-site energy production. With, one, with the construction of One Bryant Park, built and occupied uh, just under a decade later, we went a step further than we did with Four Times Square with more energy conservation features and greater amount of on-site energy production with a five megawatt uh, natural gas powered turbine that also served as a 
cogeneration facility, providing heat for heating and cooling in the building. So, and this really, it was the first building of its size uh, to be platinum LEED certified and uh, helped uh, to set the precedent once again for uh, sustainable uh, building, office buildings here and around the world. So when you think about uh, energy consumption and the amount of energy that is consumed by a building, uh, there are three, and these aren't the only three, but there are three big factors that shape how much energy uh, that building uses and how it performs. Um, tenant demand is one very uh, great factor. Regulatory requirements and then technological capacity. So um, to get a sense of where regulatory requirements are today and where they are headed, uh, we think about the political influences uh, on regulatory requirements and this administration as well as previous administrations have identified buildings as being the sort of large emitter or large, large responsible party for greenhouse gases consuming approximately 70% of the electricity of the city and um, excuse me, 94% of its total electricity consumption and 70% uh, responsible for its greenhouse gas emissions. So uh, this forms the basis of a number of stated goals and ever more um, restrictive uh, regulatory requirements promulgated over a series of years. So it started, or I shouldn't say it started, but it, a significant start was the state declaring that we wanted to have a 15% reduction in greenhouse gases by 2015. And with Mayor Bloomberg's administration, a 30% reduction by 2030. Mayor de Blasio has taken that a step further, 80% reduction in greenhouse gas, gas emissions in the city of New York by 2050. Various laws have been passed to help uh, the city achieve those goals. Now, uh, the most recent administration has provided us this, with this nice graph to illustrate the trend by which uh, we are going to get from where we are today, approximately right here, to where we want to be, an 80% reduction in citywide greenhouse gas emissions. So, and buildings being a very significant portion of that reduction. Now, um, it, it is not clear exactly how we're going to get there, but one group, Architecture 2030, has suggested a series of ever more restrictive energy conservation codes and voluntary stretch codes starting with a 20% reduction in 2019 and then a zero net energy conservation code uh, by 2030. So <clears throat> I will uh, get back to this, but it's my belief that we can't get to an 80% reduction simply by making our buildings more energy conservative. We have to do on-site energy production if we're going to ever get close to this 80% reduction in greenhouse gases. So, and here's why. It seems to be uh, somewhat of a paradox that buildings that were built uh, a long time ago have uh, less energy use intensity, that is amount of energy used per square foot or per square meter than buildings that are being built today. So even though we have this recognition of this obligation to reduce energy consumption. And we have ever more restrictive uh, conservation codes built into our laws. The buildings that are built today uh, are consuming more energy on a per square meter basis. And I believe that it is strongly uh, based on tenant demand. Tenants to today are demanding more glass, floor to ceiling glass, and more glass means more um, sun load, and that means more conditioning. Higher uh, ceilings, so higher ceilings, more space, more space to condition, more energy consumption. Uh, denser work areas, a greater plug load, more computers, and uh, one of the highest uses of energy, trading floors where there are between six, seven, eight, even 10 screens uh, per person on a floor. 
And another trend is that people are putting, uh, companies are putting data centers into their buildings. So at One Bryant Park, the Bank of America Tower, there is a 20,000 square foot data center. That is 1% of the building's um, total square footage, approximately. And it uses approximately 15 to 20% of the building's energy consumption. So when you put these into a building, it is going to consume a lot of the building's uh, energy. And people want these in here rather than out in New Jersey in a warehouse, for example, because it brings the data that much closer. And when you're trading and millions of dollars rests on split seconds, they want the data right there. So um, let's uh, talk about how we can address this. Um, energy conservation. So energy conservation is very important and we should be doing everything that we can to build our existing buildings and retrofit uh, our existing stock with energy conservation measures. Um, occupancy sensors, uh, um, uh, very uh, staged equipment, uh, building management software that allows you to see allows engineers to see what's happening in real time and properly turn on and gauge equipment appropriately. But I think on-site generation is perhaps uh, the best way, and I'll explain why in just a moment. Uh, Durst has experience with all of these types of on-site generation. Um, and the only one we haven't actually implemented on a building is wind. We have studied it, but we have not implemented it. And to complement that, uh, energy storage is also good. We have implemented ice storage, which has uh, been done very successful. successfully. We have looked at battery storage. It has not yet uh, been successful enough. You can't compress the energy into small enough space to actually have uh, the current forms of battery storage in buildings. So this is why this is why it is uh, best, this is why we should focus on on-site energy production. When you, um, if you have a 100 watt bulb in your building and you leave it on for an hour, then you have consumed 100 watt hours uh, in your building. So that is the site energy. However, if you're plugged into a grid, I know many of you may know this already, but it bears review, it bears, it's worth reviewing. If you're plugged into the grid in the United States, it's different for different countries, but if you're plugged into the grid in the United States and you burn, if you turn on that 100 watt bulb for one hour, you have actually consumed 300 watt hours of energy to get that 100 watts per hours to your building. There's so much inefficiency at the production site, whether it's coal or natural gas, and in the transmission that you, in, on average, are using three times as much energy to, uh, uh, to uh, three times as much energy to, to be produced as you are using on site. So um, the EPA has studied this, and uh, per the EPA, you know, here's this average: 3.14 is the average site, uh, excuse me, source to site ratio for uh, when you are plugged into a grid. Electricity uh, on site through solar or wind installation is much closer to a one to one ratio. Natural gas, if you're using a natural gas turbine, then the increase is only approximately uh, 5%. So this, if you have natural gas turbines on sites in buildings, then you are using approximately 60 to 70% less energy than if you're simply plugged into the grid. Now. Uh, the problem with uh, solar and wind on buildings, and we've done quite a bit of this, this is a, an electrochemical fuel cell. The problem is that um, they, there's, they do not provide enough energy uh, for the dense needs of your typical office or even residential uh, tower. So we experimented with uh, electrochemical fuel cells at four times square. And uh, the maintenance that was required on these was so great that we ended up, uh, we are in the process of actually removing them. So this is not something we recommend. 
we have implemented uh, photovoltaic panels. So we were amongst the first to do this on Fort Times Square. These are incorporated into the spandrel panels. Um, we first figured out that the payback on these would be about 30 years. Uh, uh, given the, the given unforeseen costs, it actually is going to be more like 500 years, but and they're only going to last about 25 years. So, um, but this was this was several years ago. We had much better luck at the Helena, where we incorporated panels with the improved technology and the incentives. Um, these have performed much better, and the payback is better. So it's something that would be good for a building if you can incorporate it appropriately, but is never going to meet the dense energy requirements um, of a building. So we, we considered a wind turbine on one Bryant Park, and <clears throat> but we did not put the wind turbine on because uh, we measured the wind for a year on the existing building, four times square, uh, using an anemometer, and we discovered that the wind was simply too dirty. It was either dead calm or really strong and did not pr provide the type of energy that a building could use. There are also problems with uh, being able to store that energy and then use it at the appropriate time. So we ended up putting a five megawatt cogeneration facility into uh, One Bryant Park. And we are very, very pleased with this. Now, uh, one, re one thing that we have been criticized for, you know, it was the first LEED Platinum building, we were criticized because it uses, it uses so much electricity. Now, again, 20, approximately 15 to 20% of this is used by that data center. These are buildings that were required to report energy uses per local law 84. And these are the selection of buildings that are greater than a million square feet and are either office or financial office buildings. So these are our closest uh, competitors. Now, because we use uh, off-site, excuse me, because we use very little off-site energy and we produce energy on site, we are not the greatest user of electricity. We still use quite a bit, but uh, we use less electricity overall and some of our competitors are using uh, more than us because they are plugged into the grid. Now, if you look at how well we provide that electricity, how efficiently we provide that electricity, we provide it uh, perhaps in this class of buildings, we're perhaps one of the most efficient providers of energy, even though the total energy usage is greater. Said just one more way, uh, here is the energy usage that is used on site in green, these bars right here. So out of these five buildings, some of our closest competitors, we use the greatest amount of electricity on site. However, because we produce a lot of it on site, we only use perhaps 50% more. Whereas our competitors are using three times as much because they are plugged into the grid. Now, it seems like I, there are a lot of, we're not the only developer in New York City to try to tackle this problem. There are many uh, great developers doing a lot of great things. Um, for example, the, the Cornell Tech Campus, there'll be a 26-story tall uh, passive house certified building. Uh, we're very much looking forward to seeing that happen. We would like to see more people, uh, more developers do on-site cogeneration. But there's a problem. The problem is that when you are, uh, when, you divide, you, when you have on-site energy and you want to have backup power from the grid, uh, the, our local public utility uh, will charge you basically an arm and a leg um, to, uh, to provide that backup. That rate has increased 14% year over year since we installed, uh, since we installed the, uh, the cogeneration facility uh, in 2009. Now, I understand that this is being reviewed. I look forward to seeing this reviewed and I hope that we get pointed in the right direction and we can see more direct, more um, more cogeneration throughout the city. Otherwise, I have to question uh, whether or not New York City will be able to remain ahead of the energy curve. And um, what we are doing at our, uh, our Howitz Point development, where we're developing 2,000 residential units, is we are building a building that will be, uh, only have a natural gas interconnect 
and will provide all of its own electricity and all of its backup. Uh, the increases in technology allow us to do that today. So uh, that concludes my presentation. I thank you for your time.